Did you know that there are some conditions in the spine where the skull can actually become loose in its attachments to our spine? It's called craniocervical instability. Yesterday, I presented the case of a 68-year-old female who came to my office with complaints of neck pain. She had a history of rheumatoid arthritis and has had neck pain for a number of years that she just associated to her RA. She had a lot of popping and cracking in her neck anytime she turned her head side to side. And she noticed over the past several months, she's began to develop weakness in her hands, trouble with balance, and even trouble swallowing. An MRI was ordered by her rheumatologist that showed basilar invagination. Basically what we see here is compression of the brainstem from where the C2 bone has began to sink inside of the skull. We also call this condition cranial settling because what we see here is the C2 bone has began to sink inside of the skull and let me show you what it should look like. Our C2 bone is classically shaped like a triangle and it's called the dense and there should be some separation between the skull base and C2. Here's a good cartoon that demonstrates the C1 and C2 anatomy where you see that the C1 bone is classically shaped like a ring or a circle and the C2 bone is shaped like a triangle. You have your atlas, which is C1 that's shaped like a ring and your axis, which is C2 shaped like a peg and will stick in and allow your head to turn side to side and it'll rotate on each other like that. And it's a pretty strong joint structure. We're talking about structures that are really high in the cervical spine that sit right next to the brainstem, which is a critical portion where all the neuronal pathways pass from our brain to go into our spinal cord. So what can happen in basilar invagination is there a weakness in those ligaments that support C1, C2, and you can get cranial settling. The C2 bone can begin to sink inside of the skull and compress the brainstem. That's what we're seeing on this patient's MRI, and it's crowding the foramen magnum where the brainstem exits skull and begins to form the spinal cord. You can also see the cerebellum back here, which is the back part of our brain that's starting to also crowd the foramen magnum and causing a Chiari malformation. Essentially what I'm trying to explain is there is a lot of crowding of a very important vital structures that exit the skull and go down into the spinal canal and it can cause problems like our patient is having. Compression of the spinal cord will lead to what's called cervical myelopathy. It's where the spinal cord is pinched and everything from that level down begins to not function correctly. So the patient can have balance troubles, trouble with weakness in their arms and legs, and even falls. Headaches are an extremely common symptom in basilar invagination, as well as neck pain. You can imagine that if your skull is not being held onto your spine correctly, you're gonna have neck pain and headaches. The headaches can be contributed to a variety of different symptoms, including obstruction of the frame and magnum because of the Chiari malformation, leading to trouble with the flow of spinal fluid and can cause a hydrocephalus or a buildup of fluid on the brain. That's because the spinal fluid that normally circulates within the brain will typically exit down through here. So if this is obstructed, you'll get a backup of fluid and leads to the headache. Other symptoms include tingling or numbness in the hands, dizziness or lightheadedness, nystagmus or twitching eye movements, or even a shock sensation when they lean their neck forward because that can compress the nerves even further. Symptoms vary in severity, but are usually worse when the patient leans their neck forward. Basilar invagination can easily be overlooked and be misdiagnosed as a musculoskeletal disorder. So it's very important to recognize some of these important symptoms. And if it progresses far enough, it can even cause sudden death from compression of the brainstem. This can be acquired in conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, and in fact, up to 8% of people with rheumatoid arthritis will have some demonstration of changes on imaging consistent with basilar invagination. The C12 joint is often affected in rheumatoid, and you can even get a C2 panis, where there can be a large arthritic abundance of tissue that can form on C2 and compress the brainstem. Degenerative basilar invagination typically happens in folks as they get older, but there are congenital forms that can happen in children. It can be present at birth for no reason, but it can be caused from other conditions such as osteogenesis imperfecta, Marfan syndrome, or Klippel-File syndrome. 
It can often be associated with Chiari malformation and syrinx. You can even see this in patients with connective tissue diseases such as Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. It can be diagnosed on CT or MRI and there are a few measurements we can use in aiding to make that diagnosis. This is something called McRae's line where we draw a line from the basion to the epithion or basically we're measuring across the foramen magnum to see if the dens crosses that line. Okay, in English, basically, we just draw a line from here to here, right where the foramen magnum exits, and typically the C2 bone should be about five millimeters below this line. So if the tip of this crosses this line, that is basilar invagination. There are several other types of measurements, including the Chamberlain line, as well as the McGregor line, but I'm gonna leave those out for simplicity's sake. Now do you guys see why geometry is important in high school? If the diagnosis is made, what's the treatment? If the patient is symptomatic of their basilar invagination, surgery is the next step. This isn't something that's just going to get better on its own. The goals of the surgery are to decompress the frame and magnum by pulling the C2 vertebrae back into place and locking it into position. How are you gonna pull the C2 back into place? Well, we do it by something called cervical traction, where we can attach a ring on the patient's head, hang weight from that ring, which will physically pull the skull out of the spine. This is done in a hospital setting with a patient under close neurological evaluation. Once that C2 vertebrae is then pulled out of the skull base, we can take the patient to the operating room and perform a C1-2 posterior fusion where we go through the back part of the patient's neck and place screws into C1, screws into C2, and place rods in between to hold it together. We want to make sure that that C2 bone is pulled out of the foramen magnum to restore normal cerebrospinal fluid flow. That will take the pressure off of the brainstem and allow spinal fluid to flow out the foramen magnum. In cases where we have difficulty with traction or we can't necessarily decompress the foramen magnum, we may have to fuse the skull base to the upper cervical spine so we can clean out the area where the brainstem is pinched. C1 and C2 provide a lot of range of motion of our neck to turn our neck side to side. So when we fuse that, the patient will be pretty limited after surgery and their ability to turn their head. It's critical to educate the patient going into this surgery that they are gonna lose a significant amount of range of motion. In instances where we have to fuse the skull base, they will also lose a fair amount of translation where they tilt their head up and down. That means that most patients after this type of surgery will have to use their body to be able to turn their head side to side. It's a tough surgery to undergo, but it's necessary to restore the patient's neurological function and even potentially save their life. Our patient underwent cervical traction followed by a C12 fusion and was in the hospital for approximately three days before being able to go home. After her surgical recovery, she had significant improvement in her symptoms as well as reduction of her neck pain. She's now a year out from her surgery and despite her limited neck range of motion, she is markedly better than she was going into the surgery. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Hope you guys learned something this week. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.